Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on the immune system. Now, before you watch this, make sure you are competent with the basics of animal, plant, and bacterial cells, um, evolution, and communicable diseases. I've got videos on all of those things earlier in this playlist, should you need. Now, in this video, we are going to be looking at physical barriers and chemical defenses, the specific immune system, the primary immune response, the secondary immune response, antibiotics and then how we develop medicines. So now we're going to look at how we prevent infections. Now importantly this is preventing infections so it's not about killing the pathogens that have infected us it's about stopping the pathogens from entering the body in the first place and the first set of um, methods we've got for doing this we refer to as the physical barriers. Now physical barriers what they do is they block and or trap pathogens before they're able to infect us. And there are three that we need to know about. So our first physical barrier, the biggest and most important one, is our skin. Our skin covers our entire body and just forms a physical barrier that most pathogens cannot cross. So for example, you know, let's say your friend's got a cold um, and they cough on you and some of it lands on your skin, that in itself isn't enough to get infect you because the pathogen cannot cross through your skin. That's also why getting cuts can be dangerous for us because if we get a cut like that, we break that physical barrier and we allow pathogens to gain direct access to our blood and therefore it's easier for them to infect us. That's why it's important to clean up after a cut, to treat it with a plaster and so on. Our next physical barrier is found in our lungs. Now, in our lungs, lining all of these airways that you can see here, we have this really thick, sticky liquid called mucus. And this thick, sticky liquid traps pathogens. So as we breathe in, we've seen on the previous videos that um, a major route for infections is the airborne route. You know, someone coughs out some pathogens and then we might breathe them in. And we are regularly breathing in pathogens, but most of them get trapped by this mucus in our lungs before they're able to infect us. Now, if that mucus was to stay put, then there's still a chance that those pathogens can infect us. So we also have the ciliated cells in our airways. Now, the ciliated cells are these cells here that have all these little hairs on them. And those hairs are constantly waving and wafting, and that moves all that mucus up and out of our lungs and into our throat. And we've all had that experience of coughing up some mucus or coughing up some phlegm as we tend to call it. And you can either spit it out or swallow it, but either way, it will prevent the pathogens that are trapped in it from infecting us. Our next way of preventing infections is what we call chemical defenses. Now, our chemical defenses are there to kill or destroy pathogens before they infect us. And there are two to know about. So the first one is what we call lysozymes. Lysozymes are enzymes that are found in our tears, in our saliva, in our mucus and our sweat. And what they do is they kill some bacteria by breaking down their cell walls. Not all bacteria, there are plenty of bacteria on our skin that can survive lysozymes, but lots of other bacteria are killed by them and therefore can no longer infect us. The other big chemical defense is the hydrochloric acid that is found in our stomach. Now, do not say, do not say stomach acid. That is not specific enough to get you marks in an exam. Say specifically about hydrochloric acid. Now, hydrochloric acid in our stomach has a pH of around two. And at that point, the pH is so low that it denatures the enzymes in the pathogens and that kills them. Again, a bit like with the lysozyme, some pathogens are adapted to be able to survive that um, pH2. So it doesn't kill everything, but it does kill a lot of the pathogens that otherwise might cause us harm. Now, despite the best efforts of our chemical defenses and physical barriers, some pathogens will still make it into our bodies and infect us. And so now it's time for the specific immune system to kick into action to destroy those pathogens that do infect us. So the specific immune system is the body system for destroying or for killing pathogens once they've infected us. Do not say fighting. Fighting is just not a scientific term. It makes it sound like they're 
getting out their swords and running around trying to stab each other. It's not that. This is about the body trying to destroy these pathogens that are causing us harm. Now, we're going to look in detail over the next few slides at how this works, but we're going to try and learn some key language first. So, the first language we're going to learn is the idea of the antigen. Now, an antigen is a chemical marker on the surface of a pathogen that identifies it as a pathogen. Now, importantly, each pathogen has antigens with a different shape. So if we look here, um, we've got some COVID, flu and cholera pathogens, and we can picture the antigens on COVID as being triangle shaped, on the flu as being circle shaped, and on the cholera as being rectangle shaped. Now, they're not actually those shapes, but that's there to represent the idea that each different pathogen has its own antigens, its own chemical markers that are a different and specific shape for that particular um, uh, pathogen. Now, the next uh, key word we need to know is the idea of the antibody. Now, an antibody is a Y-shaped protein that can stick to antigens. So antibodies are made by our body and they have a specific shape that can stick to each specific type of antigen. So for example, this, path this antibody here has got those little triangle shapes at the end that are complementary to the triangle shapes on the COVID. So that antibody would be able to fight the COVID uh, pathogens, but it wouldn't, for example, stick to flu because flu has got these circular shaped antigens that are the wrong shape for it. So the flu antigens would stick to this antibody with the right circular uh, complementary shape. And equally, the cholera antigens would stick to this kind of rectangle shaped antibody there as well. So antibodies are these proteins that stick to the antigens on each of the different pathogens. And each antibody has to have the right specific shape to match the specific shape of the antigens on our pathogen. Finally, we've got a lymphocyte. A lymphocyte is a type of white blood cell and it produces antibodies. So you can see here, this is our lymphocyte and you can see all of these antibodies that are stuck to it. In this specific one, it is the uh, lymphocyte making these antibodies that would stick to the antigens on the COVID there. So this uh, and this lymphocyte would work well to, to destroy COVID, but it wouldn't work against flu and it wouldn't work against cholera because its antibodies are the wrong shape for their antigens. So now we're going to look then at the primary immune response. And the primary immune response is about how the specific immune system responds the first time that it's infected by a pathogen. So that pathogen has evaded our physical barriers and our chemical defenses and has now infected us, what does the body do? So the first step then is that exposure to the new pathogen. Um, and in this case, it's the flu. And just note that our pathogen is coated in these circular antigens here. Now, step two is that a lymphocyte, remember they're the white blood cells that make antibodies, a lymphocyte with the right shaped antibodies will stick to the pathogen's antigens and become activated. Now, this is not a straightforward or simple process because in our entire body, there are many billions of lymphocytes and it might be that only one of them is producing the right shaped antibodies to stick to that pathogen. So let's say this lymphocyte comes along. Well, it's got these triangle shapes on the end of its um, antibodies. So that's not the right match. So it won't work. So let's say another one comes along. So this one here comes along. It's got these square shaped ends to its uh, antibodies. Again, they're the wrong shape for those circular antigens. So it doesn't work either. And we will just go through this process again and again and again until eventually the right um, antibody uh, or the right lymphocyte with the right antibodies comes along like this one. And this one does have these kind of semicircular ends that will match those circular shaped um, uh, antigens. And now this is the right lymphocyte and that will become activated. And once it becomes activated, it will make many 
identical copies of itself and you can't really see it clearly because it's very small but all of these will have these same y shape uh, sorry semicircular shaped ends to the antibodies that will match that um, flu virus so now at this point what will happen is all of those many many copies of that lymphocyte will flood the body with antibodies which can then destroy the pathogen something like this so you can see here how all of these antibodies are sticking to these flu pathogens and that process helps to destroy them now after uh, the after the um, pathogen has been destroyed most of those memory lymph most of those lymphocytes will die we can see that happening here so all these ones are toast they're dead they are no more but some of those lymphocytes will then remain behind in the body to become what we call memory lymphocytes and that will help us the next time that we're infected with the same pathogen so now we're going to talk about the secondary immune response which is about how the body responds on the second and subsequent times that we meet a particular pathogen now in the primary immune response we've seen this on the previous slide um, the primary immune response is slow it takes a long time to find the right lymphocyte and for that lymphocyte to be activated and to make copies of itself to produce enough antibodies to destroy the pathogens that are infecting us and we can see that on this graph here this graph shows the antibody concentration on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis and we can see here it takes a good kind of 10 days to produce enough of the antibodies to destroy the pathogen now in between infections we've seen that memory lymphocytes remain in the body and that then means that whilst our antibody levels will drop because most of our lymphocytes have died, we've still got those memory lymphocytes around. So our antibody levels drop, but they don't drop to zero. And we can see that here. We can see how there's a low, but still you know, real amount of antibodies remaining in the blood. Now, here's the really clever thing. Because we've got those memory lymphocytes that are remaining in the body, the second time we get infected with a pathogen, what happens is this. Those memory lymphocytes cause a large and rapid production of antibodies. So if we look at this graph here, we can see that the line for our antibody concentration is peaking at a much, much higher level than before. So we're, we're both making more antibodies, but also if we look, the gradient of the line is steeper, which means that we're making those antibodies much faster. So those two things together mean that we can make enough antibodies to destroy the pathogen before we suffer its effects. So we, we aren't made ill by the pathogen because we're able to make enough antibodies to destroy it quickly before it can harm us. And at this point, we say that we have immunity to the pathogen. We are no longer affected by it. Now, sometimes we find that um, our immune system struggles to fight a particular pathogen uh, and we'll need to give it a bit of help with some medicines. Now, one type of medicine we can take is called antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are medicines that are used to kill bacterial infections. And we can see a, um, an agar plate with a bacterial culture there. And each of these different discs has got different chemicals on it. And you can see these zones around some of them where the bacteria are not growing. That's because of the antibiotic effect of those particular uh, substances. Some of them, you see, is having no effect whatsoever. So those aren't good antibiotics, but things like that one and that one and that one, these are all good antibiotics that are able to destroy the pathogens. And you can see that these two with the biggest dark circles, those are the best antibiotics. Now, importantly, antibiotics do not affect other types of pathogen, such as viruses, fungi and protists. So antibiotics will only help us treat bacterial infections. Now, antibiotics work by inhibiting, that means preventing certain processes that happen in bacterial cells. And so because viruses, fungi and protists work in different ways, those the antibiotics won't affect them uh, in the desired way. An example of this might be penicillin. Penicillin is the first antibiotic we discovered and it's still a common one that's still prescribed today. Um, that prevents bacteria from building their cell walls. So for example, because human cells don't have cell walls, we're not affected by it, only the bacterial cells are. Now, really importantly, 
overuse of antibiotics has led to the, to the development of what we call antibiotic resistance, um, which you will have seen about in the evolution um, video I did earlier in this playlist. Now, antibiotic resistance um, in many bacterial species is making the antibiotics less effective. This is a really major challenge for modern medicine. Um, so developing more, uh, new, more effective antibiotics is one of the major challenges affecting modern medicine. There's a possibility that even basic things like you know, very simple surgeries will become too dangerous in the future because of antibiotic resistance. So unless we can get these new antibiotics, a lot of our healthcare could be under threat. Now, antibiotics are just one of many different types of medicines that you might be given in your life. Um, and so this slide is about looking at how we develop those new medicines. And there are three stages in this process. The first stage is what we call the discovery stage. This is about producing new compounds that might potentially work as medicines. Now, this might involve things like extracting compounds from living organisms. Let's say there's some herbal remedy that's been shown to have some kind of um, effect against a particular disease. Well, the scientists might try and find the active compounds in, in that uh, herbal remedy and extract those and see if they can turn that into a medicine. It can also involve uh, chemists in their laboratories producing brand new compounds as well. So once we've got these compounds that might potentially work, we're not just going to stick them into people because that is a, a dangerous and be very expensive to do. So we, we have this what we call the preclinical testing stage. Now preclinical testing is essentially before people. So there are two aspects to this. The first part of it is about testing compounds on the cells that are grown in the lab. And we can do this, you know, we can grow cancer cells just on kind of little nutrient dishes in the lab. And we can add these potential medicines to them and see what effect it has just on those cells in the lab. If it's showing some kind of uh, positive effect, the next stage would be to test that compound on live animals. Now, this is pretty controversial. A lot, a lot of people think this isn't something we should be doing. Um, however, in general, scientists do this reluctantly because they don't want to see animal suffering, but they recognize that the results of this research can lead to real improvements in people's lives. And so they think on, on the whole, it is worth doing. Now, if our new potential medicine passes both of these two preclinical stages, they move on to clinical testing. So this is where we start to give the potential new medicine to real people. It's given to them by doctors and those people are then very closely monitored and measured to see, uh, to check for safety and to check whether it works. And there again, there are two stages here. Stage number one is essentially a safety check where healthy volunteers are given very, very small doses and then their, you know, their health is very closely watched to check for any potential harmful effects of the medicine. And then the next stage is to check, does this actually do what we want it to do? And this is what we call, uh, they do what we call a double blind trial. So in this double blind trial, large groups of patients are given either the compound or a control placebo. So that control placebo, they'd still be given a pill, but it wouldn't actually contain any of the medicine. And importantly, neither the patient or the doctor knows who's got what. Only a trial coordinator knows who's, who's got which medicine, and they're only told at the very end of the trial. And what happens then is that um, the patients are very closely monitored, and hopefully we'll see that the people that are given the actual medicine do better, their health improves more quickly than the people who are given the control placebo one. And what that does is that gives them something to compare and it helps to avoid bias. And if that compound does show that it has that positive effect, then we know from this double blind testing that it's, a, it's, an, import, it's an effective medicine and then it can start to be given to patients uh, uh, across the country. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.